Welcome to Legal 123s with Berta Dotto. Legal issues simplified through real client stories and real world experiences. Creating simplicity in three, two, one. Welcome back to Legal 123s with Berta Dotto. I'm your host, Brad Dotto, with my co host, Michael Bird. Thanks, Brad. As a business and healthcare law firm, we meet a lot of interesting people mm -hmm. and learn their amazing stories. This season, we're entering the most sophisticated season of a business. Brad, sophisticated means fancy, okay. as we've talked about. Yeah. Our theme this season is buying and selling a business. Well, Michael, as many people have been listening know, that's just one of the four seasons. What are all the seasons? Yes, Brad. We uh, we start with the building season, starting a business, and then we went into the operating season, running a business. We have the scaling season when you're growing a business, and now we're in the buying and selling season. Awesome. Well, thank you, Michael, for that refresher. Now, Michael, do you and your family, do you ever shop at Target or Neiman Marcus? Yes. Um, neither are frequent places that we go, but we did just go to Target recently. Um, and, of course, man, when my kids were younger, I felt like we uh, supported the uh, Target store nearest us, <laughs> kept them in business. Fair, very fair. Are you familiar with their core audiences? Um, kind of. I mean, I, I have an impression of it. So shoppers, uh, you know, going to Target is kind of an affordable brand. And Neiman Marcus is more of a luxury brand brand and have some edgier clothing lines along the way but um but definitely you would think of it as more uh, higher end uh, why are you asking me about these companies fair would it seem weird if these two companies ever branded products together well it's definitely hard to picture why well believe it or not back in 2013 they collaborated on a clothing line okay i'm Curious. I'm. I'm trying to picture. You know, Neiman Marcus and Target Home Goods, um, but maybe that's not what it was. How did it go? Not well. Uh, the partnership marketing campaign didn't make uh, as much sales as expected because the two brands are, as you kind of described, polar opposite. This meant that both of these brands isolated their core audience. Target customers couldn't pay for the expensive brand that offered edgy clothes, and Neiman Marcus customers were, you know disconnected from the Target's affordable brand. As such, it was a huge co-branding failure. So rather than bringing them all together, they just confused them. I guess looking backwards, it does seem like a terrible idea. I do wonder what their strategy was in the first place. Like, what were they thinking? What yeah, happened? who knows? That's a great question. I'm sure hopefully they learned a valuable lesson here. Um, next, I know you've heard of it. Kraft and Starbucks. Well, yes, both have been staples in my life at different times. Kraft Mac and Cheese, uh, you know, was a, a almost a daily meal when I was back in college. Sure, and uh, and at times we also our family has kept the local Starbucks in business with our our visits. Um, why are you asking? Did you know that they too co-branded a product together? Co-branded mac and cheese, Ooh, coffee mac and yeah, cheese, yeah, coffee mac and cheese. Well, okay. if they're listening, I hope you get some uh, of the uh, royalties for that idea. Uh -huh. But no, that was not it. Kraft and the Starbucks collaborated on what was supposed to be a mutual beneficial deal. They agreed that Kraft would sell packaged Starbucks coffee to uh, to grocery stores across America. Well, I definitely remember back when I saw Starbucks coffee, you know, grounds or beans in the in the grocery store for the first time. Seems like a good plan. Yes. Yeah, it yeah. was until Starbucks accused Kraft of not meeting their certain conditions of their partnership agreement, which include Kraft not looping Starbucks in on their marketing initiatives. These failures were said to be eroding, quote-unquote, Starbucks brand equity. Mm, fancy. As such, in 2010, they actually terminated this 12-year strategic alliance with Kraft. Well, it had to have had some level of success if it lasted for 12 years. Yeah, I know. I, I guess it was only mostly successful. Cause, and Kraft was not happy with ending of this partnership and accused Starbucks of trying to end the partnership without fulfilling their conditions after Kraft had helped Starbucks grow their packaged coffee business from $50 million to $500 million. That's a lot of coffee. Yes. Uh, so where are you going with this? All right, stick with me. Okay. Well, I... We all know brands that have done amazing when they're the perfect fit. Think about Nike, 
Nike and Apple, or Mm -hmm. Doritos and Taco Bell. These brands came together to create a solution that meets the needs of their target groups. Uh, Whenever or however, not all brand partnerships work out for the benefit of both parties involved. In fact, some of them end up having a a negative effect, resulting in loss of time, resources, and revenue. Well, I usually have, uh, I do speak Brad, but you can be hard to figure out. But I definitely see where you're going with the story today because I know what we're going to be talking about. I know that the same thing can be true when you're buying and selling a business. And uh, if they don't have the you know, the right chemistry or understand their tar- target audience, things can go bad. Awesome. Well, you know, we have two people off camera right now, Cheyenne and Cynthia. So put a gold star next to Michael's name. He's starting mm-hmm. off great today. Mm-hmm. You're starting off strong, Michael. I'm proud of you. Yes. So let's get to today's story. Today, we start with Dr. Emily Kraft, a highly respected pain management specialist, has dedicated her career to providing um, compassionate and expert care to her patients. She's built a successful practice over the past 15 years, known for its patient-centered approach and individualized treatment plans. However, as the practice grew, Dr. Kraft faced increased challenges in managing her business on the, and just mostly with the operational side. Dr. Emily Kraft, I see that you are going the easy route today, Brad, with your names. Okay, just taking, plucking them straight out of your opening story. Yes. Got it. Okay. Well, I like it. We can roll with it. The age-old problem with with this kind of setup you gave on Dr. Emily Kraft uh, with a physician and medical practice is time. There's yeah. not enough of it. For sure. And, uh, and so there is a constant friction between physicians doing what they've been trained to do, treat patients, which, by the way, is also how they make money. Yes. And the other side of it, actually running the business that they own. That's right. And so the ministry of burden was impacting her ability to really focus on the patient care, leading up to concerns of, of long-term stability of her practice. Um, recognizing these limits in her managing the, the business aspect, Dr. Kraft sought um, external help. She explored various options, including hiring additional administrative staff, investing in advanced practice management software, uh, consulting with healthcare management experts. How are these solutions that um, she considered didn't really fully address the needs or really alleviate the pressure that she was having of running this growing business? So in addition to the problem of time, which I just talked about, finding the right people to serve in the right role is hard. Right. And we've talked about, you know, multiple times of the challenges of hiring and retaining top talent. I know last season in the scaling season, we camped out an entire episode when we had guest Mary Beth Hagen on to kind of tackle this topic. Yeah, absolutely. Well, as Dr. Kraft was, you know, struggling and weighing all her options, she received an offer from a private equity group called Target Capital Partners, interesting in acquiring her practice. Uh, this promise of a large um, payout and professional management support seemed like a viable solution to these challenges that she seemed to not be able to help with her growing practice. Uh, the private equity firm presented an attractive proposal offering to take over the business management via management service organization model and allowing Dr. Kraft to focus on patient care. Well, at least you are staying on brand with your lazy naming of the parties today <laughs> with the Target Capital Partners. Um but when you were talking, you referenced the MSO model, and it makes me think that Dr. Kraft is in a CPOM state. For a quick reference, I know we've talked about this on many episodes. Uh, CPOM is the corporate practice of medicine. In many states in the United States, there are laws that say, essentially, that if your business is practicing medicine, only doctors can own that business. There's many variables or exceptions that can apply on a state-by-state basis. But when you have the CPOM issue and you have private equity, almost always you're going to have the MSO model that you just mentioned as the solution, a management services organization to, to manage the, the, the physician-owned practice. Oh, my gosh. All right, Cheyenne, Cynthia, second gold star for Michael's put it on this chart. He's doing great. Good job, Michael. Right. Do I get you, a trophy, too? Not just gold How stars. How many gold stars equals it's, a trophy? It's a lot. I mean, it's almost a whole wall now. You're okay. doing wonderful. Yes, you're correct again, Michael. CPOM State, uh, Target Capital Partners, was interested in acquiring Dr. Kraft's practice and, and really what is a ability to really promote 
you know, this investment known for investing in various sectors, including they have invested already in pharmacies and diagnosis labs. Uh, the firm's primary owner, uh, James Marcus and Rebecca Bell, came from non-medical backgrounds with expertise in finance and business management. So you said they, they owned pharmacies and diagnostic labs. Did they also kind of have experience on kind of the services side with medical practices? Nope. Uh, neither Marcus nor Bell had any background in healthcare or medical practice management. The, their understanding of medical field has really limited the finance aspects of these investments. They viewed medical practices through the lens of business efficiencies and profitability, emphasizing cost controls, revenue maximizations, and obviously streamlining operations. So I'm seeing some red flags starting to pop up. This lens that you speak of, a pure business, can be combustible without understanding kind of the needs of a medical practice of safe and kind of patient focused care. So it raises a question, who was running the MSO to assist Dr. Kraft? Oh, the MSO was solely owned by Target Capital Partners. And as such, Marcus and Bell appoint themselves as the managers of the MSO. So the same two people with limited knowledge of medical practice operations. The same. Um, Their primary focus was on implementing a system that aligned with the private equity group's business strategy. Okay, so this is actually a red flag. This lack of experience does not seem to solve the problem that Dr. Kraft was trying to solve. She was looking for help with managing her practice and, and potentially recruiting and retaining of her team. And that doesn't seem to be the focal point of what they're bringing to the table. Yes. So hop in the the DeLorean with me. We're going to fast forward for six months later when we first were brought into this conversation. Uh, Dr. Kraft had retained litigation counsel Uh and wanted to terminate the deal for breach of contract by Target and um, other unprofessional actions by the MSO. Unprofessional action sounds so daunting. (laughs) Uh, That really escalated fast in six months. Tell me what happened. First, the MSO was supposed to handle all the day-to-day operations. They assured Dr. Kraft that they had a great track record on this process. Instead, it became very obvious very quickly to Dr. Kraft that Marcus and Bell had no idea how to manage a medical practice or medical personnel at that. Okay, well, give us some examples. For starters, the managers of the MSO wanted to align, this is their words, Mm -hmm. the practice with their business strategy, meaning the MSO's business strategy or the PE in this mm-hmm. case, the MSO started sending emails and texts to Dr. Kraft's former staff, which now actually were employed by the MSO after the closing. And the staff needed to increase the referrals to Target Capital Partners' ancillary facilities. Remember, they had the pharmaceutical and labs. This created a lot of pressure to meet the um, Target's referrals on the staff, that many of the which really uncomfortable with being pushed to refer to these labs and pharmacies. Well, Target Capital Partners may have a target on their back soon if they uh, are are focusing on this referral pattern. I'm sure um, you know that you there you it raised that Stark Law and anti kickback laws and other ethical issues. Um, I'm. I try to stay away from that it's as true. you kind of do our heavy regulatory work, of course, with Jay. And uh, But even I know that there are significant restrictions on referrals, and finan- physicians can't be financially incentivized to refer patients to affiliated services unless they meet kind of the specific regulatory requirements to do so. Ladies, get out another gold star. Michael, you're crushing it today. It has to equal a trophy now. It, it must be. I mean, okay. three stars and one is a trophy. I'll get you that participation, that like that typing participation award kind of thing. Mm, no, um, I want the real deal. Okay. Marcus uh, responded was that he was aware of all these regulations that you just so are uh, so brilliantly explained to everyone, but the MSO had assured um, Dr. Kraft everything was compliant. Well, Dr. Kraft kept um, explaining to the MSO team that she and her staff, there's a standard of care they were supposed to require that they had to follow. And the physicians should only make these referrals based solely on medical necessity and not on financial incentives. If the staff is being pressured to use these facilities regardless of the patient's needs, that's an issue. Further, it obviously could harm the patient's trust that the that these providers keep ordering these excessive labs and pharmacy uh, scripts. Finally, Dr. Kraft had concerns of the risk of, of legal issues, including with her commercial payers who are being charged for most of these tests. Sorry, I blacked out after you said I was brilliant. 
how, how did the MSO team respond to this? Well, the MSO owner was actually didn't do a good job responding to them. They actually said they were frustrated with the mm. lack of referrals that they wanted to see better results. The MSO started pushing harder because they believed it was essential to their business model. Further, many of Dr. Kraft's key employees started to leave as they could not stand the management style of this MSO team. Uh, and further, it even started becoming very obvious uh, to Dr. Kraft that they were not helping her with the day-to-day management. Uh, you know, they were actually making things worse since her team was u- leaving um, her, 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 her practice. Well, you say essential for the business model. I think um, they must have had a business plan that was counting on these referrals to their ancillary Weird. places. I know. Uh, well, no wonder there was so much pressure. And it sounded like they were kind of at an impasse or things were not... Not good. Well, especially when you told me uh, that it had escalated so quickly. Well, let's let's go into commercial and discuss the legal impact and what happened with Dr. Kraft and what options that she had. Many business owners use legal counsel as a last resort rather than as a proactive tool that can further their success. Why? For most, it's the fear of unknown legal costs. Bird Adato's Access Plus program makes it possible for you to get the ongoing legal assistance you need for one predictable monthly fee. That gives you unlimited phone and email access to the legal team so you can receive feedback on legal concerns as they arise. Access Plus, a smarter, simpler way to access legal services. Find out more. Visit birdadato.com today. Well, welcome back to Legal 123 to the Bird Adato. I'm your host, Brad Adato, with my co-host, Michael Bird. Now, Michael, this season, our theme is buying and selling a business. And we're talking about real stories that happen to our clients as they're going through this season. Today's story has a lot of elements to it, and... um, we kind of have to break it down to a couple major issues here. We have the first, the unsolicited offer. Second, the lack of due diligence performed um, by the seller. And the separation of, of understanding between businesses and medical decision making. So that's kind of like the way I, you know, where, you, where the story is going. But let, Michael, let's, let's address first this unsolicited offer that they got from this private equity group and maybe some of the pros of, of why someone would even consider it. Yeah, and and you know this obviously things we know didn't turn well. So this is more theoretical. Why would what are the advantages to doing this in the first place? Well, obviously there's a financial infusion, and right. so uh, and you can't uh, ignore that that there uh, you have this uh, this infusion of cash that can a help take take some you know money off the table for the doctor, but also help you know, kind of create this bigger checkbook to invest in new technologies, invest in staffing. That was a problem. Invest not just in in having more staff, but having the time to do it. Yeah. Um, and and so then you kind of move on. Okay, what are some other things? Well, this is a biggie for Dr. Kraft. That's professional management. Having that expertise to relieve the burden so that she could focus on patient care. And so... I suspect I wasn't involved with this this deal that that would have been a, a huge motivator to have that expertise, the wisdom that that goes there, and the administrative relief of having someone else deal with the day to day stuff. Yeah, and I want to just jump in real quick on on the financial piece. The, I mean, one of the, the I mean, not only is she getting an infusion, but you know, if done correctly, she may have one of her biggest paydays ever. So this huge liquidity event occurs where she's having cash that she never even dreamed about having. Yeah, and and you know, if these go well, there's without getting too much in the weeds, there's a there's a, a future chance for an even, you know, a we call it sure. the second bite of the apple, yeah. but a, a future event to have an, another exit. And so um, you know, it can be extremely attractive and and advantageous to uh, you know, that would definitely be one of the pros. And Again, you know, what are the the growth opportunities that go with this? So you have this capital that we've spoken of. We have this expertise that we've spoken of. And, you know, where can they take the business if you have kind of those resources? And uh, and so I can see why, uh, you know, that would be a, a major attractive um, element to, to doing this, to having this offer come through. Yeah, I think the other – piece when you have an unsolicited offer is that it's right there in front of you. You don't have to go through any other 
organization to take you to market. I mean, they're coming to you, and you, you're not. You don't have to go through the entire routine of, 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 of taking it. So from that percent, you know, all of a sudden you have an offer. It sounds great to you. You take it, and you don't have to do anything else. It's immediate response and immediate ability to, to tackle that. There's an emotional pro to it, I yeah. guess. It can be a downside too, but. Um, it feels really good to be wanted in the in the business scenario too, and yeah. so you someone tells you that uh, they like what you've built, they like they love you, and they want to invest, and uh, and so um, you know that in of itself can be an intoxicating feeling, and and be something that you you know you, attracts you to doing this. Michael, I like what you built. You're doing a good job, buddy. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, talk about the negatives. All right, so some of these cons I was thinking about, it's most some of it has to do with the unsolicited offer, and some of just in general, just understanding when you are having the ability to sell into private equity or, or anyone else, just some different things to think about. So I kind of broke it down to two major kind of areas. Um, one is just understanding it from a management style, like. What are what's being brought to you from management style? You may have a different style than they do. Um, so start s- slowing down and spending some time with them to understand how they plan to come in and manage you. Because in this case, that's one of the important elements to her. Um, and so, I, you know, based on what we learned is she really didn't understand how little they understood uh, about management styles. Um, and then find out really, to your point, you said this earlier, is, is what are they trying to get out of this purchase? Well, in this particular case, they were trying to find, you know, um, someone to come in and help their ancillaries. Here's somebody who needs it because of the pain management. They had pharmacy needs, they had lab needs. So this is a, a great way for us to capture these referral source. And you need a, you know, the con is the conflict of interest issue here. Like that should have been up front mm-hmm. on center that they understood that that they were going to push her to shift from patient care uh, to financial uh, goals that inf- emphasize the ancillaries versus hers. And I want to jump in, too, on the the prior point of, you know, the, kind of this alignment of management styles is even if it was perfect, like everything that she hoped for, you have to acknowledge that a downside to getting this unsolicited offer is the you're you're losing control of your business Good in point. some way. Yeah, agree. So the other, so not only the management style, but then going back to this conflict of interest r- raises the the perfect area that we were known for the compliance risk. Right, mm-hmm. the compliance risk is all of a sudden is has someone really truly slowed down and figured out um, the risk associated with what they're asking to happen after the fact. So, you know, you brought up, which is still shocking, mm-hmm. Stark Law and anti kickback statutes. Obviously, um, for those who've listened to us before, we talk about even if this was a cash-based business, you have unprofessional and unethical issues that you run into with medical board and nursing boards. So, again, that's the understanding truly where they're going with their end goals. What does that look like? And so financial targets are important, Michael, so I'm not discounting that. But we have to understand, are they, is this financials beneficial based on, your in this case, her practice or their ancillaries, which, by the way, I should have said this earlier, she had no ownership in any of that. So it was not – she was not benefiting from that at all. It was purely the, the, the target piece that was benefiting. So you know, for her, she should have understood that if – you know, which he was not interested in, but comp, you know, she was interested in being patient, focused, and having help. And in this particular case, that was not the case. So, I think that kind of um, leads us to we, the well, the biggest con after that, which is she had lack of knowledge of what other potential buyers could bring to the table. So she had emotional situation where she tried other things that didn't work. Someone says, "Hey, you look really cute." Why don't you go on a date with me? And the next thing you know, they're married, mm-hmm. and she never had a chance to date anyone else in this very fast moving industry and so that the the lack of uh of ability to go to market and see what other people would be interested in and what type of management skills they have and comparisons was an issue for her. but play Mike, the field play right? the field there yeah. you go mm-hmm. well and and so michael on that talk about we use this fancy word called due diligence and why it's so important when you're selecting these potential partners so let's define it first. It's it, it it's a pretty intense process. So it, it's the part where you're the the parties are investigating and inva- and evaluating kind of the other side, the partner, the people, 
and the investment, you know, before finalizing a transaction. So this happens after a letter of intent and, you know, you can be assured that when you have private equity that they are digging deep and looking at at you and the business to make sure what they think they have is what they have. And so the process is, you know, pretty systemized. I mean, especially on, on the buyer side and it should be on the seller side, but uh, where you're reviewing the you know potential partners' operations, their financial status, um, the their kind of legal standing, and other you know compliance factors and other critical factors. The goal is to evaluate risk and the benefits associated with joining forces in a partnership, and so you want to make sure you have all the information before you make that commitment. But Brad, why don't you talk about uh, kind of the importance in these types of deals of the due diligence? Yeah, and you kind of were alluding to this. The number one reason why buyers and sellers should utilize this due diligence on each other is risk mitigation. I mean, that's what you're trying to do. Uh, during this phase, you're, you're trying to identify what are the potential risks and liabilities associated with if we come together. Again, financial, legal, operational side. Uh, mm-hmm. By uncovering these issues before you go further down the aisle, again, about going to our dating move, Organizations can kind of make a more informed decision and avoid these costly surprises if this deal is going to be good for just one party but not mutual, right? So that's mm-hmm. why you want to – you know, if they're going to spend time learning about you, you should be learning about them. And this allows both parties to have an informed decision if they should go forward with you know this quote-unquote partnership. And importantly, this could have helped Dr. Kraft with this group. Because she quickly learned that they had never managed a medical practice before. And and with a little due diligence on her side into them and their background, she would have she would have figured it out. But, um, you know, Brad, Brad, quickly kind of outline why is it essential to separate the the business and the medical decision making. Yeah, and, and we've talked about in this in, in a couple of MSO podcasts before about separation of, of, of church and state. And the number one reason, obviously, is providing patient care treatment must be consistent with the standard of care, which the physician and all the providers with that physician must follow. This centers around the focus on patient needs rather than financial considerations. Again, I'm not mm-hmm. saying anything wrong with that. But but for them, for the, um, in a number of states, and, and then these federal rules we were talking about, you really want to avoid situations where you you get in a situation where the financial and ethical conflict of interest start appearing. Uh, if the business decisions, such as referring or, or, tr- or for more referrals or more treatment protocols, are influencing by financial rather than prioritizing the patient, um, that's that's well being. That starts becoming an issue. So the whole you know patient over profit kind of concept. Ultimately, even in an MSO model, providing medical um, autonomy is essential for compliance between the business side and the medical side. Yes, a, a business and medical decisions often require different types of analysis and expertise. Uh, so you separate them, and that ensures that each area kind of receives the mm-hmm. appropriate focus and the right people uh, involved, so it leads to better decision making. Um, it also minimizes the pressure on healthcare providers to compromise clinical standards for business reasons, which she certainly was facing here. And it and you are focused on patient care and really focused on kind of that effective del- care delivery. Um, as we've talked about uh, before, uh, this clear separation ensures that business practices are aligned with long term term goals of the practice, you know, again, without compromising the quality of patient care. So I'm curious, Brad, what happened with Dr. Kraft and Target Capital Partners? Unfortunately, they're in litigation for the next six months as Dr. Kraft just wanted out and was trying to salvage what was left of her practice. Uh, as I said, we were brought in to assist Dr. Kraft's attorney on guiding them through these issues um, um, as we... Uh, and as we mentioned, this helped, uh, obviously, in a, um, in, a, in a mediation of things we were discussing already. They were eventually able to settle, um, and Dr. Kraft uh, was able to um, get her practice back, but she had to return most of her purchase price. Um, they did let her out of the non-compete, mm-hmm. um, but she got her practice back. Um, and she told us that she had a dug, you know, a little bit deeper. She would never have done this deal with this group. The due diligence? Yes. Okay. 
Um, and if, if she ever tried to go this route again, she would spend a lot more time finding out if the buyer truly understood her business and how to manage a medical practice. Sounds like she may have needed some of her own pain management services. <laughs> <laughs> what are your final thoughts, Brad? Yeah, I mean, we, we said it, you know, when, when profit meets practice, there's a balance to it, right? Um, successful integration requires understanding respect for the medical ethics and a commitment to patient-centered care. Uh, I guess to summarize it, while this unsolicited offer from a private equity group can offer much-needed financial benefits and growth opportunities that you were talking about earlier, but it also presents risks related to the control, patient care, uh, operational alignment, and each party must weigh these factors carefully to determine if this pen- potential advantage outweigh the actual p- potential drawbacks. Uh, Michael, what are your final thoughts? I'm restating a lot of what we talked about. Sellers commonly do uh, do not do due diligence on buyers of the business. That obviously was a, a big part of today's story. The other side of it is that private equity will leave no stone unturned in evaluating a practice, and uh, it's a, it's appropriate, it's important to make sure that the seller does the same thing. They investigate the buyer and, and make sure that they can do the things that they're promising to do. Absolutely. Well, Michael, next Wednesday, you and I will be back, and we'll actually discuss in more detail a Wall Street deal that you and I recently worked on. Thanks again for joining us today. And remember, if you like this episode, please subscribe. Make sure to give us a five-star rating and share with your friends. You can also sign up for the Bertadotto newsletter by going to our website at bertadotto.com. Bertadotto is providing this podcast as a public service. This podcast is for educational purposes only. This podcast does not constitute legal advice, nor does it establish an attorney-client relationship. Reference to any specific product or entity does not constitute an endorsement or recommendation by Bertadotto. The views expressed by guests are their own, and their appearance on the program does not imply an endorsement of them or any entity they represent. Please consult with an attorney on your legal issues.